why don't I start off with a quick historic background as to the effort itself? Uh, that would be then, great. Uh, yeah. Yep. So um, a few years back, we started working with uh, version 3.0 of the rules. Um, it was quite obvious rather quickly that they were insufficient for dealing with some of the issues that we were being asked to address. Um, as such, uh, we started a conversation, um, so to speak, back then to make sure that we understood what some of the concerns were, a lot of them around uh, end of life. In fact, we got some questions on end of life that we'll be addressing later on. Um, but it became quite obvious that trying to change the rules that we had before um, was um, probably not the right way to do it. We want to take a, a good solid look at the rules to try to understand um, what had been documented versus what had been um, discussed and sort of semi agreed to within the program. So it was important for us to try to take a, a white sheet of paper approach to this. Um, and we began uh, a dialogue uh, about two, two and a half years ago about changing the rules from from scratch, so to speak. So this was quite an effort. Um, and in March of 2023, it was quite obvious that the SPWG, where this was occurring, needed uh, needed some assistance. Um, Art stepped up as the uh, document editor. He has had a lot of experience doing this kind of collaboration work in the past and stepped up as the as a documenter for the CNA rules. Um, we started making real progress. We had very productive calls. Um, although some of the topics went on for weeks, um, that was needed. So from March of 2023 until May 8th, I think it was when the official vote was done, um, uh, we have been working to assure the rules are uh, reasonable, uh, from a standpoint of um, beneficial to the program, beneficial to the CNAs, but at the same time, it is um, trying to genericize certain aspects, and you'll hear about this in a few minutes, um, certain aspects of uh, assigning CVIDs that in the past have been very problematic, and we're talking cloud and future evolving technologies like AI. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Art. Um, one thing I do want to state that these rules at this point in time are in sort of a transition phase as folks get smart about what the rules are. This is one of those efforts. We we totally encourage you to ask questions. This is your opportunity to, to get the answers that you are, are needing or wanting. Um, you may not get the answer you want, but you you know the reality is um, we want to make sure you have an opportunity to have that kind of discussion. Effective August the 8th, these rules will be in effect. That means um, from that point forward, uh, we will discard the 3.0 rules and uh, CNAs will need to comply with the new set of rules. So with that disclaimer stated, I want to uh, pass it back to Art and go from there. Thank you, uh, Kent. Um, as, as noted, there's quite, quite a bit of history in this revision. Um, there's quite a bit of process as well. And just to catch folks up very, very quickly, we don't spend a lot of time on it, but we had two fairly open comment periods plus uh, sort of a CVE board comment period. So we had, um, among all the other changes, by the time we got the doc ready, we had three rounds of comments. Uh, comments came in, comments had to be, you know, adjudicated, reviewed, accepted, modified, et cetera. So um, quite a process, but again, um, our, our bet here is the investment will pay off. Uh, there, were, there, was a, there was a strong need for changes. Um, and uh, we think that the, all the time we put into it is gonna, gonna help the program a lot. Um, I'm gonna jump around a little bit just because we do have some questions in advance. Uh, I'm gonna be a little bit dynamic and not just crank through uh, the slide deck. Um, but I am going to start at this point in the slides um, because if we get this, uh, there's, a, there's a, I think, and you know, time, time will tell, but I think we've got a, um, sort of a core 
concept that's going to apply well and generally to a lot of assignments uh, and CNA behavior um, for the coming for the future here. So I want to hit that one first. Um, and these are the highlights of sort of the biggest changes. Uh, and we're going to add uh, end of life fits in here very well as well. So if there are perhaps four largest changes, we'll talk about EOL handling. Um, some of the questions we got in advance were were related to end of life assignments. So we'll we'll, we'll go through that in detail. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but I'll you know I'm going to talk for a few minutes next. Um, we'll watch for hands raised. Please do raise hands. We have uh, a lot of people here, 130, I think. So. This is a hand raising situation, please, not a jumping in verbally situation. <clears throat> um, so probably the biggest core thing, and this this isn't exactly a change, but perhaps a um, a more explicit and careful rewriting of uh, somewhat you know culturally current behavior. Um, the CNA with the most appropriate scope. And this is really code for almost always a vendor CNA, a supplier, a developer CNA, right? If the organization, if the people, if the entity who creates the software is responsible for uh, analyzing, investigating, and potentially fixing vulnerabilities, right? If that organization is a CNA, you get first dibs or officially first refusal. Uh, and this means if there's a CVE assignment pending, uh, it should come to that CNA first. This means other CNAs like CNA LRs should route requests to that CNA first. And since that CNA is in fact a CNA, they are required to have uh, a way that folks on the internet can reach them and request assignments. Most often this is connected to that CNA or that vendor will have some sort of vulnerability response or coordinated disclosure process. And very often we find um, that CV assignment is connected, connected to that process. So, um, right, the, the most appropriate scope CNA, often the vendor CNA gets the first opportunity, uh, but there are time limits. So under the current rules, we occasionally run into uh, situations, and I'm, I'm gonna not say that they were in, at all intentional or malicious or accidental or what the cause was, but the facts are that an assignment could have been and was sometimes sort of delayed or held up by uh, a sort of an open pending request with an unclear answer, unclear response, unclear state of the request to a CNA with the best scope. So the new rules codify that. Um, it is very clear that the CNA with the best scope gets first the first chance, but if there is an explicit or a explicit uh, decision not to assign for whatever reason, including end of life, which we'll get to, or if there's a timeout is reached, uh, and particularly in the case of a public uh, right vulnerability receiving a lot of attention, you can imagine the occasional sort of uh, something being exploited in the wild and making the rounds and everyone's fired up about it. And hey, which CVE is that? I don't know. Is it out yet? I don't know. Um, there's a CVE out, but the description's not published yet. Is it this one? Is it that one? Those sort of high stress situations we really, the program very much wants a CVE out quickly on those so that we can talk about the thing. Um, so there are timeouts, there are time limits, but very officially the vendor CNA gets the first, first chance to assign. Um, second issue on the screen here, technology neutral, this touches on cloud uh, or AI or whatever the topic uh, of the day might be. Um, and I don't say that glibly, I mean, technology changes um, over time. I've been doing this 20-ish plus years, right? That thing, things change, technology changes. The rules specifically acknowledge the technology and opinions and norms change. What was considered a vulnerability in 20 years ago may not be today or, or vice versa, right? Um, so the rules actually require the program to keep up with the times. Um, and to consider new technologies, and if specific guidance for new technologies or different technologies means something for CVE assignment, then uh, it actually says that the, the program has to consider those rules and possibly make an update to the rules. But generally speaking, we are technology neutral. So it doesn't matter if it's cloud, a web server, service only, a box product with a CD or a DVD to install it, 
uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, any of those things, um, if it meets the requirements of being public and there being evidence, sufficient evidence of it being a vulnerability, and that's <laughs> that's another discussion, um, then it is it is a candidate for getting a CVE assignment. Um, so after uh, and there was a lot of deliberation and there was a whole side, sort of an ad hoc side group of people that went off and discussed um, cloud assignment in detail. Um, and the rules both incorporate that work, but also the decision was eventually to not have technology specific uh, assignment guidance. Um, what I think this is going to mean practically for everyone is if uh, somebody operates a, you know, web cloud service only um, to the extent that, that such a thing exists and there is a, you know, right, standard web app vulnerability in it, cross-site scripting, SSRF, right, something. Um, those can have CVE IDs assigned to them. Under the old rules, only the CNA if they were the provider of that service, had the power to assign a CVE. Under the new rules, that assignment is treated like any other assignment. So the provider of that cloud service has the first refusal, but if they choose not to assign, someone else can. A researcher can request of a CNALR, for instance, or a researcher or a research organization with CNA powers can assign if the provider of the cloud service chooses not to. Uh, so that's a meaningful change if you are in a cloud service provision uh, business. Other CNAs, after following first refusal, can assign for your services if you choose not to. That, I think, is the key takeaway there. Um, I'm going to do three and four, and then I'll pause for, for uh, help from my other board members uh, and any questions. Um, I, I, I touched on this, right? This. Evidence, sufficient evidence of a vulnerability is a is a whole other uh, whole other discussion. Uh, there is a lot of improved guidance there, but at the same time, there's explicit acknowledgement that CNAs have to use judgment because we can't actually write the rules that cover every single possible case of, hey, is this a vulnerability? Is this a vulnerability? Uh, my bet is most of the folks on this meeting have had <laughs> discussions and investigated uh, this idea of is this condition in a software behavior software of vulnerability or not. Um, we acknowledge that CNAs need to use judgment and that is OK and they should use judgment. Also, the improvements in the in the vulnerability determination guidance uh, are largely around some things that are not vulnerabilities. So there's a, 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 some improvement about physical attacks, which kinds of physical attacks might be a CVE and might not be. Uh, there's this guidance about um, you can consider technology, but technology uh, needs to be neutral. It can't, it can't, the kind of technology that is vulnerable cannot by itself um, decide or be the factor that decides whether or not to assign uh, a CVE ID. So there's some changes there as well. Let me cover EOL briefly uh, also at this point. Um, looking back after many months of work, my suspicion is that the first refusal rule effectively covers cloud end of life and all sorts of other um, reasons a CNA may or may not choose to assign uh, an ID. Nonetheless, we did call out right technology neutral assignments and cloud issues, and we do call out some special handling for end of life. The summary is um, <clears throat> there are there there are suggestions that a CNA. Uh, especially a vendor CNA, documents how they handle end-of-life assignments. Uh, and the CNA is welcome to say that they do assign for end-of-life. CNA is welcome to say that they do not. Uh, there's a recommendation in the rules that we prefer that CNAs do assign for end-of-life. And there's a couple of important points here. One, which is very important, and it, I realize it's often, often sort of glossed over in practice, but uh, a CVE identifier, right, labels, names, identifies a vulnerability. It does not identify a fix. A fix is technically completely independent of the vulnerability as far as CVE is concerned. So it is entirely legitimate in the CVE program uh, to have a CVE assigned to possibly end-of-life software that everyone knows and is clearly documented will never receive a fix. 
That is an absolutely legitimate CDE assignment. And the program wants that because consumers of CDE want to know, do I have vulnerabilities? Of course, the next very important question is, how do I fix it? Can I fix it? Do I get an update? What's happening? But the first and foremost mission of CVE is to identify the vulnerability, and that one exists. Uh, the other parts of vulnerability management sort of come after that. So end of life, not end of life, cloud, not cloud. It's a vulnerability. It gets an ID. Um, we encourage, again, we encourage EOL assignment, but that's up to the CNA. Uh, if the CNA declares in advance, perhaps publicly, perhaps in their CNA scope statement, that they do not assign for end of life, that basically meets the first refusal criteria. So another CNA with appropriate scope can assign for end of life products made by that other CNA. But again, end, uh, first refusal comes first. So the CNA needs to either um, state in advance how they have handled uh, EOL assignment or on a case by case basis decide whether or not to assign for EOL. But if that first, uh, first CNA chooses not to assign for EOL, perfectly valid choice, if they don't assign or the request times out, other CNAs can assign for that particular product or service. Uh, I'm going to pause here and first ask um, Kent or Lisa if they'd like to add anything, and I'll take a peek at the chat and paste a couple of URLs as we as we go through that. All right, let me uh, let me start now. Turn it over to Lisa. Um, the first right refusal is something that is uh, extremely powerful from the standpoint of the CV rules historically as well as um, in the past. Having the ability to control your message um, to the community about a certain issue is very important. And with that uh, ability, that right that you have uh, as a CNA that for vulnerabilities that are either in your products or your services, then that gives you um, a, a real um, a, a real sort of leg up when it comes to dealing with the issue globally uh, from a public relations perspective. So uh, just as a quick summary, you know, CV IDs you know, can be assigned, may be assigned for vulnerabilities in EOL products. Um, the key here is that we really do want the vulnerability identified. If there is legitimate proof that this is a vulnerability in an end of life product and you um, are, as, as Art said, and you are going to issue a CVE, do so. Make sure it states it has uh, an unsupported when assigned tag, which basically means that when the CVE ID was issued, the product was already end of life. Do not expect an update. So uh, how you deal with this is something that you should consider as a part of your processes to make sure that you understand um, what the, you know, how you can work within the program. Um, we try to give a lot of flexibility in that regard. Um, but it's really important that um, you know you, you you use the tags to indicate that something has been. It, it makes the community understand a bit easier that this is end of life and you're not going to deal with it um, because you can't either because of a certain situation of uh, uh, availability of the systems that you need to use to test it or the like, whatever the case may be. Um, but make sure that you use the proper tags for the proper um, issue. And Lisa? Um, hi, everyone. I just uh, like to emphasize that I think that that we're in a different world today than we were 25 years ago when the program started. And I think the rewriting of this rules this time sort of um, sort of hopes that people are going to lean on the side of assigning CVEs and as opposed to say, oh, no, I, I don't think that we need to assign for this. So what that means for Microsoft is that we're going to start assigning CVEs to no, no action vulnerabilities in the cloud. So if we can fix it all on our own, um, we still may decide to sign CVEs for it simply to, <clears throat> to document the vulnerability, to allow people to understand that it's a, it's a vulnerability, even though 
nobody can do anything to help themselves. Our customers can't help themselves, but we're going to point out the, 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 the CVE, the type of CVE, the scoring about the CVE, the root cause analysis for the good of the industry. So I think that more and more people just have to have to say, you know, all complex software has vulnerabilities. It's for the good of the industry to talk about those vulnerabilities so that we can all learn about it and grow together in 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 our maturity. So I think it's just a different mindset. I know that that inside of Microsoft, we're working hard between now and when the rules go into effect on August 9th to really try to put together the processes and procedures that are going to allow us to easily decide whether it should get a CVE ID or not. And so I think that everybody has to do a little, little bit of soul searching in their P-certs to think about what these new rules mean for them. Back to you, Art. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kent. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I want to uh, emphasize something Lisa just covered. Um, you know, it's a very common discussion, and we had this many times, and it's perfectly valid, right? The cloud service provider very, very often, right, fixes the vulnerability. There is no, no patching, no user action. None of the customers or users have to take any action, right? The online application is just fixed, and the fix is deployed in seconds or minutes or hours, overnight, whatever. Um, no, no sort of response action of the typical sort, right? Patch, change a change of configuration is required for some of those types of vulnerabilities. Absolutely true. Very common situation. We acknowledge that. Um, but it turns out there are other reasons um, someone might want to know, and we we don't know all these reasons, but we discussed reasons such as. Uh, I might need to do something else. Maybe I don't need to patch the cloud service because my provider very quickly fixed it. Thank you, provider, for your secure offering and your quick response. But I don't know. I was investigating an incident last week, uh, and it would, it would have been good to know that there was a possibility of something uh, coming in through a, a cloud service issue, right? Or th there, are, there are a number of reasons, and we don't always know all of them, that it's just fundamentally helpful to have right? a presumably comprehensive, we know CV is not comprehensive yet, but we're working on it, uh, identification and list and an, a number for all of the, of the vulnerabilities. And again, as I mentioned earlier, whether or not there's a fix, if you feel like using CVSS base scores and aren't going to manage things below a four, whatever your criteria is, you first need to know about the vulnerability, then apply your risk assessment, prioritization, severity metric, whatever you want to apply to that and decide what to do, and then take action on probably not all of the CVEs, but some of the CVEs. I've heard many times, and I very much appreciate that somewhere out there is guidance that uh, my service shall have zero CVEs or my product shall have zero CVEs. Uh, quite honestly, anyone creating that sort of documentation and policy is incorrect. They're factually wrong. It's impossible to have no CDEs, pretty much practically impossible. So the question really becomes, I want to know about all the CDEs, and then I want to apply, right, my risk assessment, my filter, right, my processing uh, about how to handle this. But we first need to know about it before we can decide. And, and those decisions can be separate, right? Kent and Lisa and I might all decide to do different things with the same CDE ID. That's perfectly valid. But we do want to talk about the same vulnerability even if our response to it might be different. Uh, Lisa, your hand is up. I, I just wanted you to touch on a little bit that between 4.2.2.2, 1 and 2, <laughs> there's an or, ah. and the or is significant, right? Because we okay. worked a lot on that or. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Yeah, so no, please, you, Lisa, you go ahead, so, please, yeah. So either it, it has the potential to cause significant harm or it requires action or risk assessment. So that's why I'm saying that even if it doesn't require action or risk assessment, if it's an important vulnerability, <laughs> then you should assign a CVE to it and talk about it. And so that we spent a lot of time deciding whether that was an and or an or, and, and we eventually decided it should be an or, which which 
causes us to, you know, assign more CVEs than before. Yeah, and you know, the the a handful of us who spend a lot of time on these on these rules, um, Lisa is not wrong. There are a couple of words in here that had um many hours and dollars went into choosing the words. Uh, and I again, I believe the investment will pay off, but you know, a logical and or an or or what what the list says, uh, you can be pretty confident just about every word in here was very carefully gone over. Um, I'm I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's an improvement. But uh, um, it is not actually a joke that some very expensive words uh, in this document. Uh, I'm going to look at chat and see if I can do these quickly. Um, Significant yeah, harm is left up to the eye of the beholder, I'd say. Uh, it is. I don't think we define this. Oh, I should mention um, this is actually material. Uh, there, uh, we have revised the glossary. And this was necessary because of the uh, changes to the rules. Um, a couple of issues came up. One, we found multiple CVE guidance and rule related policy documents that had their own little glossaries tacked on at the end um, that were not always consistent. So one plan moving forward is that this site shall be the official CVE program uh, terms and definitions glossary. Um, so when you see these terms used in the rules document, uh, you, you very much may need to dereference sort of the definition here. And uh, these definitions mean something. So um, independently fixable is pretty important. Publicly disclosed is very important. Um, there is a, uh, a, a behavior that is sometimes sort of negatively called silent patching. Um, and I don't, I, I, personal professional opinion, not a huge fan, but there are reasons for, you know, carefully managing public disclosures. Um, but for CVE, uh, CVE program and the CVE CNA rules purposes, this is an important uh, distinction. Um, if somebody publishes a software update, um, I appreciate somebody might publish an update, fixes a vulnerability, great, addresses the CVE. Uh, maybe the advisory is delayed intentionally by hopefully not too long, a few days. Uh, that's fine. But the moment that software is publicly available, that update is available, the CVE program considers that vulnerability to be publicly disclosed. And the reason for that is, sure, not everyone, not most users, not most customers, not most people on the planet. But some people on the planet uh, are going to reverse engineer that patch, and they do this every time. And they know about, they can find out quickly, uh, relatively quickly, about vulnerabilities in there. So that date, that moment of public disclosure is now tied in CB program rules, at least terms, to uh, the software fix or the software update being publicly available. Uh, so we, we, we do not uh, address or make a judgment or a requirement on when a vendor or a vendor CNA publishes the advisory, for instance, versus uh, publishes fixed software. But the, the, the date public is now pinned on the software being available, and that starts the, uh, the timer for the CNA needing to publish the CVE record that corresponds with that vulnerability if there was one assigned. So um, this was debated at length, but the decision is sitting here in the term publicly disclosed. Uh, and so you'll see some, uh, we, 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 we link them in the rules document, but you'll also, also often see them capitalized as like a proper noun. Uh, those terms um, are defined in the glossary and that might matter. Sorry, let me get back over here and I'm gonna try to go through uh, to go through chat again. <laughs> so, so I'll just help you out, Art. Um, Thank you. Yes, great. Cassie is asking what's what's the definition of significant harm, and there there isn't one. That's where the discretion right. comes in be, for mm -hmm. CNAs. Um, for me and Microsoft, I, I consider if if somebody well, okay. 
so we have our own way of assessing things, right? And so so if it meets the bar, which we have our, you know, our bug bar out there public, um, if it's critical or important, what we call critical or important, that that to me is significant harm. Um, st starting out with critical being most significant harm, right? And then if you go on to Ben's question next, do we go back in time? I personally don't want to go back in time. When the rules go into an effect in, in August, I might start doing this before August, actually, assigning CVEs to no action vulnerabilities. Um, but I don't want to go back to last year's vulnerabilities and assign CVEs. So again, there is discretion and, and CNAs have to figure out what this means for themselves. Um, to some degree, we're all going to have to get used to these new rules, and I'm sure we're going to learn, and there's going to be some push and pull with the the CNA of last resort um, as to how this is all going to work out. And I think we just have to keep in mind that vulner that the CVE program is trying to benefit our industry, to, to mature our industry in the way that other industries have that are older than technology have matured over the years. And so I think we have to look at these new rules optimistically and and think about them. They're just, you know, we're trying to make the world a better place. <laughs> and that's the spirit of the new rules. Your turn, yeah. Art. Nope. Uh, thank you and, and yes. And um, there's a section here where we sort of go into the, try to describe the judgment, right? Explicitly call out that CNAs uh, may need to use judgment, and in fact, one of our examples is in fact the definition of of ser what, what serious significant harm might be. Um, I, I very much appreciate, right? There's a, of course, there's a desire, and I think all of us involved in the rules development had this, right? It would be great to have a absolutely explicit, perfect flowchart um, for how to do all of this stuff. I I will argue with anyone that is absolutely not possible. Um, because of the nature of the work here, right? What is a vulnerability in the first place? If you can define that for everyone successfully, I will absolutely follow your definition. I don't think that's possible and that's okay. We accept uh, an interesting, you know, philosophical ambiguity here. So judgment is necessary. Um, there will be cases where a CNA picks, you know, picks an answer and a different CNA, very possibly a CNA LR in the hierarchy picks a different answer. Um, the way we've designed this is right distributed authority, distributed responsibility out to the CNAs. Uh, is an uh, is a uh, sorry a uh, dispute resolution policy. Sorry, that was the EOL policy I posted. I'll I'll grab the link in a minute if someone else doesn't. But there's a there exists a dispute resolution policy. It's linked linked right here. Thankfully, um, we accept that right of all the CNAs of all the vulnerabilities of all the CVE assignments. It's not going to be perfect every time. There's going to be a continual proportion, hopefully not too too large, of disputes, uh, rejections, duplicate assignments, um, disagreements in judgment that can't really be resolved by explicit facts. Um, we accept that. That is part of those are part of the rules. That there is a uh, resolution process in place. It's actually going to get some attention next. Um, is our is our solution to that? We firmly believe we cannot define a universal uh, answer to some of these questions. So instead we define, define a process by which they can be resolved or you know, what is good enough for the CVE program. Um, there's another note in here, and I'm not sure where it is exactly, and it touches on what Lisa already said earlier. Um, my version of it is, and it's not a must in the rules here or a must not, it's a, it's a, it's a note or a should, but if uh, if you have sat around with your PCERT and your security team members and your developers and you've talked to the person who found the vulnerability and is reporting it to you, and maybe you've talked to a peer CNA, and if you've spent, I don't know, four or five collective hours of effort trying to figure out if it should be a CVE ID or not, you probably just want to err on the side of assigning one. Um, if, if for nothing else, possibly for cost purposes. I do appreciate the cost of assigning a CVE does mean things to CNAs, absolutely. So I don't want to, we don't, we don't say where that economic sort of tipping point is. Um, but in sort of, sort of philosophical terms, if you're not really sure, but you're discussing it with experts at length, 
our, the, the rules suggest erring on the side of an assignment. It's still the CNA's choice, CNA's judgment, but the, what, what our suggestion is, if you're not sure, bump the needle you know, one point over towards the assignment. Um, sorry, broken links, that should be fixable. Uh, I'm scrolling back up through chat here for a moment. Yeah, very, very basically, and again, the 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 uh, the policy separate separate policies exist that you must also read. Um, dispute resolution for the most part follows your your CNA and your root hierarchy. So uh, your you should go to your go to your root, and that can go up the hierarchy uh, as needed. Um, actually, the starting point should be: Can you resolve it with folks who are, are close to the problem and you're immediately talking to, right? If it can be resolved by the CNA or between two peer CNAs, great, right? The the most effort uh, performed at the edges of the graph, right, of the distribution of the federation, is is better better scalability for everyone. Um, and for that matter, and this has come up in the chat as well, right? CNA LRs, and the more central you get, you have more uh, you have more request pressure, higher rates, um, right? People who know about that vulnerability are probably the people closest to it, and they're probably at the edge of the federation. Right, a CNALR has to get spun up on the case, read up about the vulnerability, try to make a determination. Um, so those things, you know, centralized that puts more pressure on the CNALR just in terms of rates and volume. It also puts more requirements for them to have expertise on everything, which is very very difficult. So try to resolve things locally move up your hierarchy only as needed is the is the overall plan for dispute resolution. Yeah, and there's something to be said for owning the message, right? Oftentimes if you know bad things are happening in our in our industry and sometimes it's just easier if you assign a CVE, put the bad thing in a box and talk about it and own the message as opposed to trying to hide it when it might get out and miter should not own the message. It's just better if you own it yourself. Yeah, if anyone um, can find it quickly, we do discuss, Lisa, you, someone asked about timing, uh, right? And we talked about going back in history and in, generally, no, there's no, there's no requirement or even a recommendation to go, to go back in time uh, to the question from uh, Ben, right? About, about 4.2.2.2. There is another timing issue that came up, and we we answered it by, in a sincere way, not answering it. Um, this is sort of the case where we have sort of a uh, uh, an improved fix, or a previous fix is bypassed. Maybe it's under bypass. Nope. Um, so it's it's. Um, a sequence of events that might happen is a vulnerability is reported, it is fixed. And then some period of time later, someone else looks at the fix and finds uh, that maybe it was incomplete or could have been improved. And this is a fair question now. Is that is that a new vulnerability in a new CVE? And both options are possible, and we actually defer this to judgment, um, right? Uh, a, a CNA, and probably a vendor CNA in this case, could take the path that, hey, uh, we're going to stick with the old CVE from last month. Um, we had a new report. We credit the reporter. We're publishing a new fix, a new update, a new patch. But it references the older CVE because it's the same core vulnerability. This is now an improved patch that is addressing additional ways that somebody found you could get around the previous patch. That is valid uh, and very very personal opinion in my adult mind, that is the somehow cleaner thing to do. However, it is also valid and allowed to assign a new CVE ID. Uh, and while this might appear to be a duplicate or cause confusion in some cases, it also has the benefit of, right, users and customers downstream notice, in fact, hey, a new CVE ID came out and now I should go for my risk assessment, do my severity metric, and decide how to handle this new CD that came out. Um, the second path, again, to me, just in a personal opinion, feels like a duplicate and a little bit messy. 
academically, but we do allow both behaviors. Both are valid. And this does, though, get a little bit to Ben's question about uh, history. So it's a CNA judgment to use an existing previously assigned and published CVE ID uh, or to assign a new one. There are a number of factors that go into this. Both are permitted and whatever choice you make, someone's not going to be happy about it. We don't have a way to solve that at present. Uh, I'm scrolling for a minute. 4.2.8, I think. Oh, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. This is in the assignment rules. So um, already mentioned, but just to, just to clarify, most of what I'm speaking probably shows up in the rules. Um, I have not been quickly finding the, the chapter and verse, but um, we talked about Right, fix is independent. So assign for vulnerabilities that, you know, of course, standard practice and normal behavior in most cases is that there's going to be a fix, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and this, the thing I just ranted about, um, right, residual insecurity, residual vulnerability, that is a choice, right? CNA may decide that it's a new vulnerability and may assign a new ID or may use an old ID. So that's the one sentence version of everything I just said. Um, we do ask if it does get confusing, and it does at times. Um, you know, you could use a bit of the CVE description or perhaps a security advisory to explain that, hey, this CVE ID is a new one, and there's a new fix, an updated patch you need to go apply. But also, uh, this is related to a previous one, right? That explanation. Might, might go pretty far in uh, resolving questions and disputes and, and concerns in advance just by saying how the, how the two CVE IDs are related. Or if the first option is chosen that, hey, there's a new fix for an old ID, the same vulnerability, but there's a better fix out, still apply the better fix, the newer, the newer update. Again, CNA's choice there. Um, so Art, one, yeah, one yes, thing, please. Yeah. One, mm -hmm. one thing to note, um, 2.1.5 um, sort yep. of talks about how we want to apply this document um, from, yes. from the standpoint of not retroactively going after issues. This is a forward looking set of requirements. It's not a backward looking set of requirements. Yes, absolutely true. And we discussed this also at length, like like almost every element in this in this document. Um, I, in fact, started off with the idea that once these rules were in place, I had a couple of things on my notes over the years. I was going to go back and try to fix assignments for no, I must not. I may not do that. So um, this is going forward. Uh, you know, it, again, it'd be great if we had somehow a source of absolutely clean, completely normalized, completely standard vulnerability information. If it's not clear to everyone on this call, that is not the world we are operating in. There, it is not clean. It changes over time. Uh, we've had some really cool data science looks recently at uh, right blocks, eras, eras in time of how CVE IDs were assigned and when CNA uh, CNAs uh, were the CNA growth sort of started and assignments went up. Um, from a data science point of view, you can actually see these periods of time where certain rules were in place or were not, or where uh, the MITRE CNA did all of the assignments. Um, so there's going to be a change, and it's going to start uh, August 8th, ninth. whatever date that is. Yeah, 9th. Sorry, 9th. Um, and thou shalt not go back in time and edit history. Um, I want to get to something I saw in chat that I think I can now answer. Uh, this is from. Uh, M. Um, and I think the answer, so the, the, the chat message is understand the disagreement between is it a vulnerability or not? So maybe a, ven a vendor CNA decides, nope, we're not assigning because this is not a vulnerability. But a researcher CNA decides, well, it is, we're publishing anyway. Um, that is covered by first refusal, assuming both parties are CNAs. The vendor CNA is within their CVE program rules uh, rights uh, within the rules guidance to not assign. And if it's a research CNA, they are within their rights to assign. 
that might get disputed right away. There might be a further discussion that might involve the two parties don't agree that might go up to uh, go up to the, the first first root uh, node in the hierarchy. Um, but the answer in that case is specifically that a research CNA could assign or a CNALR could assign. That depends on sufficient evidence of is it a vulnerability? And as noted previously, and as noted in this comment in the chat, there's some judgment to, to, to apply there. Um, and we don't have a better answer than use judgment, talk with your peers, try to resolve it, and follow the hierarchy if necessary. Uh, I'm pretty sure that collectively we don't have uh, we, we don't have the resources collectively, nor is it worth our time to sort of fight uh, right 25,000 or 30,000 CDE assignments per year. Um, and I'll spend our time better right for our, for our for product security and all the reasons. Um, sometimes the CV gets disputed and that's okay, but if everyone is a fight, it, it, the program's not working. Um, Johannes, I'm gonna look at your question here. Yep, so, so CNA does not respond to a request about an EOL. Um, this also is covered by uh, first refusal. Remember, that's a great rule. <laughs> um, the CNA is welcome to not assign for EOL, but they have to do uh, one of um, explicitly respond that they want to sign, preemptively respond that they want to sign, or let a timeout elapse. And in that case, other CNAs can pick up the task and assign. Uh, it is not just any CNA. Um, if it's a public, a public issue, there's a strong preference for a CNA LR to do the assignment mostly to reduce the chances of a duplicate assignment happening. But other CNAs with appropriate scope, possibly a researcher CNA, possibly a vulnerability coordination CNA, uh, can assign in cases like that. I'm going to try to find that, that timeout rule. 72 hours. So here's, here's a piece of it. Um, and this is, be careful here, these words really matter, right? Publicly disclosed, uh, this is the timeout for a publicly disclosed vulnerability. And as you may imagine, 72 hours was, was debated thoroughly. Um, uh, <laughs> in, those, in those high stress uh, situations, 72 hours feels a little bit long to me personally, but this was the agreement we came to. Um, please don't ask questions about business days or holidays or whose calendar or what time zone, there's no answer to those that question, which is why we decided it is literally written as 72 hours. Um, so uh, that's one answer to, again, first refusal includes that uh, no answer constitutes refusal, refusal to assign. Um, We've had two questions come up in the chat. Uh, yeah, please. Art. I can read uh, read them in order. There's one re related to uh, 2.1.5. Just to clarify, would we be able to assign CVEs to vulnerabilities that predate the rule changes? And what we're discussing here is that rules don't apply to vulnerabilities already assessed under the old rules. Uh, I think that answer is yes to both. However, um, I want to be careful about this must not here. So, you know, a, a CNA choice to assign to a older vulnerability that predates the Porto rules. Um, I think if it's if it otherwise meets requirements, that's probably OK. I think the main point here is. Um, uh, don't expect the CNA LR, a CNA LRs, plural, the coordinator CNAs, the researcher CNAs to go out and start filing thousands and thousands of retroactive now now applicable uh, CVE IDs. I think if a CNA voluntarily chooses to do that for things in their scope, and this is probably more of a vendor situation, that's probably reasonable. They're taking on the burden and choosing to do that and providing the records, that's fine. But um, if you're gonna hound the CNA LRs of the world and go bother them and file many, many requests for cross-site scripting in a web service from the year 20, 2005, um, 215 is going to come into effect, and the answer is, is no to that. 
Right. And we've got another one as well. Uh, well, yep. sort of related, actually, academic historical uh, question kind of related. Does MITRE have a position or the CVE program have a position on filing end of life CVE is on archaic software, CPM, DOS, PDVL, VMS from known vulnerabilities from lore <laughs> or previously not widely known <laughs> from private research? Would this be considered program noise? Yeah, so um, I think the the noise would be a uh, is a subjective answer there. Um, again, I'm going to give a similar answer, but uh, uh, I see Kent's hand up. So, if a CNA is doing this in a reasonable way and taking on the burden, uh, and it's not you know 10,000 new records, probably okay. Uh, and that, that's interesting, you know, from a historical perspective. 215 really is meant to, to stop the idea that we're going back to August 1st of 2024 uh, and filing, you know, requesting 10,000 IDs for a whole pile of web things that previously didn't get them. Um, so I think there's a nuance there, uh, but I want to hear what Kent has to say because um, please, Kent, yes. Yes, this is definitely what, something we talked about in depth. Um, I yeah. personally, um, you know, from an academic perspective, it, it is you still have to prove it was a vulnerability. So um, sure. how yep. we we don't want we don't want folks just randomly accusing um, uh, folks of uh, vendors of having problems that can't be proven. And in many cases, the vendors may not exist, and the products may not even be anywhere on the internet, other than maybe in the the you know computer museums of the world. Um, so, you know, the reality is this is something where you need to, um, you know, you need to use common sense uh, from this perspective. What's the value to the vulnerability management community of making this assignment? Um, history for academic purposes, I'm not sure really uh, CV is best suited for that. Um, but from the standpoint of um, is there, you know, are there situations that could arise that might necessarily uh, benefit uh, a lot of folks, there's a lot of archaic software still being run, um, I think ATMs. Um, so <laughs> from the standpoint of um, from the standpoint of uh, uh, folks uh, that want to do that, I would I would, you know, take your hands off the keyboard and probably not. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, it it. it it's it's I, I i think i would go so far as to say right this the cve mission is all about identifying publicly disclosed vulnerabilities but we do in practice have a fairly uh sort of a current focus operational focus again if a cna was taking on the burden and doing a careful job to kent's point providing evidence of right vms vulnerabilities from back in the day um it wasn't noise they were reasonably written up you know records and there was evidence of it probably no one's going to complain too much about that um but right we we definitely have concerns and this is an active discussion with the cve board and the cve program of sort of high volume uh not very specific or easy to interpret reports and assignments coming in that's sort of an ongoing tension the program has and something we do keep an eye on uh, so, um, sort of a mixed, mixed answer there for, for that question. Um, I want to get to this end of life question from, uh, Leah here. Um, so the, the short answer is those, the, the details there, right? The, the, the product may not be available even to the vendor anymore, uh, or to the supplier documentation or old versions of the software may not be present. It might be very difficult for. Uh, a vendor, or manufacturer, or supplier, developer to be able to even validate the vulnerability or produce a fix. Um, that, that absolutely occurs, uh, no question about it. The CVE rules sort of in a, in a, in a non-judgmental way don't care. The vendor could decide to assign or not. And if the vendor can't verify understandable tough situation but the vendor could choose to assign anyway based on the quality of the external report or the vendor's best assessment um, the recommendation is that uh, the vendor vendor cna should assign for end of life 
but that's entirely the vendor CNA's choice with the understanding that another CNA with, with appropriate scope, possibly an LR, can assign for that issue if it meets some level of evidence of vulnerability um, requirement. Briefly on CVSS, um, not strictly speaking required for CVE assignments and CVE records. Um, it is increasingly recommended and suggested that you do provide CVSS. Again, um, without the ability to reproduce, the vendor could choose to perform the CVSS score based on uh, the report and the information available to the vendor, even if that's not an actual reproduction of the vulnerability, uh, or choose not to provide one if, if you're not sure about the CVSS that you can't reproduce and know for sure. Um, but again, ultimately, the EOL choice is up to the vendor, and the difficulty and complexity of being able to reproduce or not are uh, respectfully not uh, part of the CVE program's direct responsibility. Kent. Yeah, if your hand is up. Yeah, that, I so. think, yep. I, yeah, it's it's up for a reason. Um, yep, so, yep. yeah, the uh, uh, this, this is one place where you as as the P-Search, you as the folks issuing and assigning CDs need to look at your PR aspects. Um, quite often, um, it's, it's easier to, this is old software, we don't have access to it, you got a, you got an out, so to speak. It's not being fielded, yada, yada, yada. It's easier just to sometimes uh, let the CVE be issued, um, you issue it, um, and control the message, um, as opposed to, you know, potentially causing a stink that could cause, you know, news articles to be written about you and the like, uh, that, you know, this is being used in five places on the internet and oh my god the world this guy is falling um so the real question here is you need to think about some of these situations from the standpoint of how it's going to be perceived downstream how it's going to be perceived by your customers and in many cases for products that are years out of date and there is no inventory and nobody's running it okay that's if if there's sufficient evidence that there a vulnerability did exist at that point in time, just do it and don't be afraid to do it. Um, we like to err on the side of of the ID, so to speak. Um, there's no consequence to you from a cost perspective, um, but there could be if the researcher or the the folks are are guaranteeing a stink. Um, try to avoid those and controlling the message is a is an important part of what you do, believe it or not. Um, see a couple more in the chat. I'm going to try to get through here. So uh, Mark, vendor CNA is aware. What's the best way to escalate assignments? I assume that would be the case, yeah, where the vendor has chosen not to assign. Um, so I think there are two different branches here as I'm reading your 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 questions. Um, first refusal covers uh, if the vendor refuses, chooses not to assign. Um, if right, if I'm a if I am not a CNA and I've reported something to a vendor, they're aware of a vulnerability, they've chosen not to assign. My path is to find another CNA with appropriate scope. Very likely, a CNA LR is the best option. Uh, there. If I happen to be a CNA myself, I'm a coordinator or a researcher CNA with scope, then I could perform that assignment myself. Um, they assign a CV only after the patch exists. That can still happen. We, we try to guide CV assignment and the publication of everything is, is, a, is a kind of a timing question. Ultimately, when information goes public, including possibly a software update or a patch, it'd be great to have the CVE public at that point in time. That's the preference. Um, a few days delay, things are not lined up to exactly the right hour or minute. That's not super material, except in the most urgent, urgent of cases. Um, so, you know, if the, the vendor somehow is internally assigning, but doesn't tell anyone until after a patch goes out, the patch goes out, everything's public, and the CV goes public at that point in time. That's probably a win for the program. Um, we do, there is something in the rules where I believe it's a should, so a recommendation that when the assignment happens, the CNA should inform 
the party that requested the assignment or reported the vulnerability about the assignment and the ID. But um, we don't want the uh, reserved but public situation to happen, right, where there are CVE IDs floating around with no advisory, no CVE record filled out. Uh, ideally, even if the parties um, under private coordination know about the IDs, don't publish those until vulnerability goes public. Uh, Simon. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I. If <laughs> so my statement, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it is a personal opinion, but, you know, I have been around for a little while here. Um, I don't know that the CV program would be willing to take that position in writing, um, although I do take your point. Um, this raises its raises it. This this discussion comes up in in a variety of places, including CV program work, um, where right there are there's someone very likely a user of software or a customer of vendor CNAs that, that has to scan and has to meet some policy requirements. Um, and there's this tension between I have to have no CVEs, please don't assign more, versus hey. The CVE yeah, just says it's a vulnerability. Whether or not it matters and you need to patch it or mitigate it or do something else is go talk to your national regulator or whoever else is applying the, the policy to you. Um, that separating those two problems and dealing with them is not directly, I don't think, the responsibility of the CVE program. Uh, I do it in my day job and personal capacity both, but I don't think the CV program is going to be in a place to to make that claim. However, uh, I would happily support it should should that happen. <laughs> uh, let's see, ticket, ticket. Um, oh, Leah, I think um, I want to say, so we, we did get at least one set of questions in in advance. Um, I started to draft a written response to all of those. Um, so we will send that written response. Um, let me see if I can handle these. Uh, uh, these questions here from Leah. So how does the CNR, CNALR collect information and discuss this? Yes. So I'll, I'll, I will generally say, um, again, there are multiple CNALRs. However, uh, MITRE does operate um, a very popular, widely used, uh, I think probably at this point, one of the ultimate CNALRs. Um, so generally, CNALR has to design, has to decide how much effort they can spend per case typically has to rely on information provided by other parties, uh, public information, and there is a resource cost issue here of right how many hours of effort does the LR spend trying to figure out uh, whether to assign or not assign. Um, the CNALR is present today, so I will, or the MITRE CNALR is present. I will defer to them if they'd like to add anything. Um, but generally, right, the CNALR is, is at least a third or fourth party to what's going on and has to sort of get caught up to speed and um, balance the cost of finding out the necessary information with making an assignment or a choice and then going on to the next case. Uh, third party package. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to call this a sort of dependency upstream SBOM related um, issue. Uh, if I if I produce software and I use an upstream component or package, there's a vulnerability with a CVE in that upstream software. I am affected by that CVE because I use that upstream software. Ideally, uh, use the CVE that already exists from the upstream software. I think that is the most desirable outcome. However, it's not always that clear, and it's especially not always that clear to somebody from the outside who, for instance, can't see right, a proprietary product source code or something like that. So there are cases where, and there's some, there's some bits in the rules about this, right? If simply using the upstream component means that I'm vulnerable sort of no matter what, definitely use the upstream existing CVE ID. If the way in which I use the upstream component can vary and make me vulnerable or not, and I'm changing my own software, for instance, the call to the library that I make needs to change. Um, that is evidence that maybe I should have my own CVE ID for the way I used uh, the upstream library. That is in the rules. Um, 
so I can find it quickly. Give me a moment here. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it is in the rules, but we do have some guidance on when to use the upstream CVE ID or to issue a new one for yourself and your use of the vulnerable component. But please, 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 um, we do bump into this a good bit. Um, it happened recently um, that a vulnerability affected the downstream component. The downstream CNA assigned an ID. Uh, however, it appears, again, from the outside that the vulnerability act actually affected the upstream library. Uh, a half hour on the internet revealed an additional CDE ID assigned. I can't tell if it's a duplicate assignment or what, but that, that confusion of and scope about upstream versus use of the thing downstream is a difficulty uh, we deal with. Sorry, somebody well, was going to speak. 432, yeah. 432 also talks about this uh, more you. specifically. Yeah, and and um, this actually also ties even back into our, our favorite first refusal rule. Um, a, we, we want everyone, but very specifically a CNA who is subject, of course, to these rules. If the CNA is not the supplier and they're considering an assignment and they're not, they don't have the best scope and another CNA has better scope, that CNA should try to tell the, the CNA with better scope um, and have them do the assignment. Um, and that's for, there's a variety of reasons for this, but um, yeah, thanks, Lisa. Uh, I've lost my window. Okay. Um, 4152, let me search that one. I think it was very wise of us to number everything. <laughs> Um, not assigning the physical vector or hardware component. Jason vector. Um, let me. I didn't. I did not read the link to the NCC group there. Um, but let me try to uh, summarize the physical access. Um, changes or refinements to, to the assignment rules. Um, the noble exception. The noble exception. I have a, I have a good, I have a, I have a funny slide about this. Uh, so let me start on one end of the problem. Um, if I physically obtain your computer and use tools to take it apart, or decap chips or a microscope or something in very small leads, and I can glitch, glitch a processor, or glitch a bus, or read the right signals and get some side channel effect out of there um, by itself that is not a cybersecurity vulnerability a technical cybersecurity vulnerability and is not candidate for um, a cd assignment well that's a should that's a should not and we'll get into the reasons for that um, an even easier situation is probably destruction right and um I wanted to go back. If the folks aren't familiar, we a CVE ID was assigned for playing uh, a Janet Jackson song or CD, Rhythm Nation, really, really loudly with a good amplifier and I don't know, 18 inch subwoofers or something, big, big bass speakers, caused the hard drive to fail. So this is equivalent to taking a hammer to a hard drive, as far as I'm concerned. Physical attack, denial of service, not a cybersecurity technical vulnerability. So on that end of the spectrum, no assigning CVE IDs for those things. Um, but there's some nuance, of course. Um, in particular, if the product, and now, now I would consider sort of a mobile phone, right, is a good example, or a hardware security module that's designed to protect, uh, has physical protections against attacks to try to get the secret keys out of it, right? Um, if the product or the software um, specifically states it has protections against certain physical attacks. And, you know, generic mobile phone example, um, after 10 failed login attempts, the device wipes itself or shuts off. Um, if my laptop has a uh, significant root of trust, secure boot sort of things enabled and turned on, there's a bypass in that. Uh, there's a bypass in the, uh, the login attempt count or something like that. 
So since, since those products and that software advertises and documents security features, um, and there's a bypass to those security features to help mitigate physical attacks, those would be candidate for uh, a CD. Um, give me a second here. There's another angle on this. So there's also, we talked about a little bit about sort of absolutely pure brute force attack, right? Somebody can always throw more packets at me than I can receive. Um, someone jams physical spectrum, cuts my wires, not a, not a vulnerability. Um, however, um, if it's something expected, I run a web server on the internet and my web server or my operating system have absolutely no limits set on connection rates or memory consumption. And probably the operating system or the, you know, the web server config actually have settings to set those, um, so set some resource limits and they're not set, that could be determined to be a vulnerability. So let me get back to whoever that was and see if that answered the question and uh, check on the list here. There's there's an interesting question about references um, yes. in the chat. Yeah. I was just going to point that out. Um, you, yep. Yeah, go, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, I'll read it out loud, but Art, you were going to check in. So so if, if that question was answered adequately, someone please just put it in the chat. Um, the question is, <laughs> excuse me, once a CVE is published, with the appropriate attestation components, typically uh, KB specifying fixed versions, et cetera. Uh, could you provide guidance on how CNAs should maintain additional references? What would be uh, the guidance related to attaching blog posts or technical write-ups, oh. GitHub repos with POCs or other material related to the original CBE? Yeah. Um, that is a nice question. Um, Ken, do you wanna, wanna take that one? Yeah. Um, First off, yes, please. Um, yes, please. The reality yeah, is more information that we can get on the attached uh, using reference URLs, you know, so that you can actually uh, link back to the site where you've got a blog, uh, a technical write-up or repo, whatever the case may be, that, that's a plus to the community. Um, the, the key here is the CV program's idea for existence is to try to be able to um, identify vulnerabilities and enough basic information about them for that information to be useful. So if you're adding references um, to what you've uh, what you've just assigned and posted, that's a that's a real value to the vulnerability management community. And that's what we're trying to do here is to assure that the defenders have the right information at the right time. And if you're providing more information, that's great. Please do. But but um, references are all also added by this by the secretariat. So the one thing that um, that changes about the CVE on the corpus is that the the MITER basically has has scanners out there to find references to CVEs and will add them to to the CVE record in CVE.org. So. Um, that should be happening automatically. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Alec. Yeah, there is that process going on. Um, and part of it right now is those those references are added to uh, the existing container uh, for the CNA. That will be changing such that we will be having a separate container uh, for the Secretariat to add those references. When it comes to the timeliness of old references, uh, there's a policy around a period of time of uh, I believe seven years where um, you know references are not updated or changed uh, accordingly over that time. Um, but with respect to uh, being added by the secretariat, as I say, um, they are added by the by the secretariat currently through the uh, um, through the CNA container, but it will be shifting to a separate container uh, in the next month or so. Yeah, I actually, I was writing on my whiteboard that no one can see um, uh, a possible future improvement to the CDE uh, CNA rules might be um, a should, a recommendation or an option to highlight that uh, additional references, even over time, are very welcome and help things. So if a C the CNA does want to provide additional records or additional references, as Kent mentioned, yes, please, is the answer. Um, and as Alec pointed out, Secretariat is 
is doing that uh, and the way the secretary is doing that is about to change. Um, but that happens anyway uh, within some limits that the secretary has. That's right. Yeah, no, big kudos to any uh, CNA who wishes to add additional information to their record and former references. Uh, I'm checking uh, Benoit here, stream component. Kent just added a question, or Kent just answered that in text, so. Oh, okay. Um, I think the answer is yes, right? Hopefully. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and oh. I, I'll say this, this is not in the rules and not supported, but um, with my CVE board member and participant hats on, um, uh, there is the idea at this point, it's not, not, a, not a formal discussion even yet or a formal change to anything, but uh, I've always had the thought that it would sure be nice if uh, a CVE record had a formal built into the spec mechanism by which it could reference another record. So um, you will see in some cases a rejected record because it's a duplicate or replaced by a different ID. And the description in the rejected record actually says that, which is very helpful and, and good to know. Um, but that type of a formal reference could be a bit of JSON. And then um, uh, records could, could clearly say this is related to an upstream ID or is, a, is an instance of the upstream ID or is a duplicate of something. Uh, but that's not nothing in the rules for today and not, not present yet. Um, but um, might help things out in the long term. Art, do you want to talk um, about malware? Yeah, there's a question but, about malware. Do you oh, want to talk crap. about sure. <laughs> <laughs> signing CVEs to vulnerable malware? Over to you. Great. 4.1.8. Four, four um, thank, thank you. I will go to the screen first. All right. And actually, we, we actually removed text about this, which I think was a good choice. So um, uh, a a, a piece of software that is deliberately right attack exploit exfil stealthy whatever code intentionally designed to work that way uh, does not is not a is not a vulnerability um, if for no other reason than um, the mal part the malicious part of that is is subjective um, the operator of that software may be doing so with um, in their jurisdiction, right, complete legal authority and be allowed to do it. And it might be very intentional. Uh, and I can imagine the receiving end might not feel the same way. But those issues are not something the CD program uh, delves into at all. So intentionally, malicious code is not a vulnerability. That's how it operates. Um, despite my sort of personal difference, slight difference of opinion, although that's evolving, um, we allow, this is historically has happened and it's happened very recently. Again, um, there's history here for, right, a supply chain sort of attack. Uh, XC utils was a, was a recent example of this. I think there was even a more recent public one, um, right? Software that was otherwise, you know, unmodified, legitimate, intentionally featureful production software is surreptitiously, maliciously backdoored, a Trojan horse is added, something is snuck in there. Um, one, one, one mindset, and this is where I start off with personally, is that that's not a vulnerability. The thing was compromised, malicious code was added that should not have a CDE ID. Um, I'm apparently in the minority here and I, I, can, I can see both sides of it, so not a, not a real problem. The rule was added to say that that might be determined, it may be a vulnerability and therefore is subject to CVE ID assignment. This has happened historically. Uh, I don't think we're about to change precedent here. Uh, and I could even argue to myself philosophically that this element of surprise, right? The software behaved a certain way, all of a sudden it doesn't. Um, the difference between it was a programming mistake that was discovered to create a vulnerability or an intentional programming bit of text, a bit of code added to cause insecure behavior I could I could gloss over that and say these are vulnerabilities. There is a surprising insecure behavior qualifies for a vulnerability, qualifies for a CVE. 
Um, what we took out, and therefore it is allowed, you are permitted to assign, is that if this subjectively malicious code itself has a vulnerability, so right, I have software that's intentionally designed to attack something, insert itself, sneak in, replicate, provide command and control, not be found, maintain persistence. Um, if it's intentionally designed for that and there's a vulnerability in it, technical cybersecurity vulnerability, you can assign a CD for a vulnerability in malware. And that is not, there's no rule about that. It simply falls in, falls under the normal assignment rules. So hopefully that, that is the complete, close to complete answer for uh, malware assignments. Lisa has her hand up, Art. Fire away, Lisa, please. I, I just wanted, I, we're running out of time, so I wanted yeah, to are. address yeah. uh, Blake Irwin's question before mm -hmm. we do run out of time. And and Blake, I, I think that, you know, words are hard, definitions are hard, writing glossaries so everybody agrees is hard. However, nobody wants to break, uh, you know, break confidential disclosure among vendors. That's just not right for the right for the world. And and we all want to, you know, <clears throat> keep our secrets until we're all ready to to produce a you know a fix and CVEs to go along with it. So I I don't think you can take any of these definitions as set in stone and somebody is going to have to break confidentiality just because the definition says so. And you can weigh in on this art. Um, yeah, it, 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 the definition, it got a lot of attention and I, I appreciate the, the, the issues and the concerns, especially with the multi-party disclosure and with supply chain issues. But the, the, I think the deciding factor, and I hope I'm not mis, mis, misspeaking for the others involved in the discussion was it, it's, it's, it's fundamentally, um, it doesn't matter who, who publishes the, the fixed software first, right? It, it, with, with some exception, it is, it is entirely possible and it's actually surprisingly common that someone is reversing that patch. And that means the, the race is on. Um, you know, is reversing that patch? Yeah, lots of researchers for maybe defensive purposes, or detection purposes, but um, people who want to maybe exploit that vulnerability are reversing that patch. So the race has started and we don't want to pretend that, oh, well, you know, we all publish some updates, but we're not going to publish the CVE or the advisories for a month. You're probably putting users at risk in that period of time. Um, so we don't we don't say it's a month. We don't say it's 24 hours. We don't say it's three days. Uh, we don't say how long, you know, when to break a multi-party disclosure because somebody, you know, published their software first or fixed software first. But we want to be clear and at least for the for CVE, CNA rules purposes, right? For CVE purposes. Um, fixed software out there constitutes a public disclosure. We realize it's not perfect and it, it, it could cause issues, but um, that was the deciding factor, really. The carrying factor was um, that someone knows it's public. Over. We are just at time to. So Kent, we're low please. on time. We're right on time. Right. There's a point to be made by Kent. Actually, Kent, your hand's up. Do you want to just say it? Yeah, the, the key here is that uh, as we go forward, we're going to be making changes to the the rules. Um, hopefully, because we've done this in the way that we have, it's been uh, um, a complete rewrite. Um, a lot of what we uh, will find will be tweaking of the existing rules. Um, we haven't yet fully um, decided on the actual process and you know for the cna community we will definitely make sure that we do um, publish that process once it's there but in general you know we're looking at a, a, a github repository for markdown where you can uh, you know put in issues for uh for things that you encounter that are you know problems for the rules as they exist today. Um, of course, you can contact the Secretariat, but you're probably better off putting it in the GitHub repository that we're looking to put up for this so that um, A, it can be seen by others, B, we can make some decisions on this and, and, and prioritize things appropriately. 
um, if they're all in one place. So um, please do that as we uh, go forward. We'll tell you where that's at and, and what we're going to do in that respect. But it's still being decided. Uh, our intention is to not make breaking, hopefully that's a subjective term, but not make breaking changes um, without plenty of uh, advanced uh, warning, so to speak, whereas um, uh, things that are just words or that don't really impact negatively um, uh, the operations, then I think in, in a lot of respects, that's those things will probably happen a little quicker. But in any case, just want you to know, we are talking about this in the SPWG about how to go forward with the future rules um, update process. And once that's documented, we'll uh, send it out for all to uh, uh, to read and understand. And from my personal perspective, thanks everyone for attending today. Yeah, thanks, Kent, and thanks, everyone. Um, we can handle further further questions, uh, possibly still via email. Uh, if you are involved in the CVE program in some way, for instance, you're a CNA, uh, you have various avenues to, to ask questions of the rules or highlight things. And as Kent pointed out, we really do want a more transparent and lighter weight uh, and um, repeatable process for rule changes in the future none of us want to go through, uh, for selfish reasons, none of us want to go through um, the previous process again, probably ever. So <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not, and more, more unselfishly, it's not good for the program to do things that way. So we're going to have something repeatable. These rules and other rules are going to be somewhere public. It's probably going to be GitHub. People can file issues. You can even file PRs and we'll, we'll figure out how to batch those up and decide them uh, again in a more sustainable long-term process. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Art. Thanks to Kent. Thanks to Lisa. It's been great to have everyone and thank you for your questions. Um, looking forward to uh, everyone adopting these. Remember the dates on when these need to be followed and I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Uh, Thanks, last, everyone. Yep. All right. Oh, Cheers, everybody. Yep. Sorry that we have one last hand up from Leah. I don't know if that's an accident or not. Oh, it went away again. OK, I think she's maybe trying to, you know, clap or something. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, Cheers and have a good day.